Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, Joe Biden goes on offense during a campaign swing in Wisconsin and Michigan. Kamala Harris becomes the first vice president or president to visit an abortion clinic as Republicans start to get nervous about their position on reproductive rights. Your favorite third party spoilers get ready to screw things up again. And uh, EPA Administrator Michael Regan stops by the studio to talk to Tommy about clean energy and environmental justice. But first, Joe Biden and Donald Trump have now won enough delegates to clinch their party's nominations. And it was quite a week for the presumptive Republican nominee. Trump floated Medicare and Social Security cuts that he's now trying to walk back, promised to pardon the January 6th insurrectionists on the first day of his second term a group that includes convicted felons who violently assaulted police officers. And Trump also visited his number one re-election battleground, federal court, to attend a hearing on whether the judge he appointed will dismiss his felony charges in the classified documents case. In preparation for the hearing, Trump employed the uh, novel legal strategy of essentially admitting guilt during a Newsmax interview where he said he took the documents, but very legally took them, uh, and said a whole bunch of other crazy shit. Let's listen. I took them very legally, and I wasn't hiding them. Nobody has, when you think of the the fake things, nobody's been treated like Trump in terms of badly. But by the way, they released Hillary Clinton. She hammered her phones. She used uh, all sorts of acid testing and everything else. They call it uh, bleach bit, but it's essentially acid that will destroy everything, (laughs) you know, within 10 miles. The Hunter Biden stuff is bad, let's face it. And... If you believe the laptop from hell, there's a lot of money that's been exchanged, and uh, it's a lot of money and seems like a lot of proof. But I I would just say to him, what do you say? What do you say, Dan? What do you say? (laughs) Hillary's gone from uh, destroying some emails to uh, packing a chemical weapon. That's just... (laughs) What? Acid? What is going on there? Less grievance, more policy, right? Uh, how's that for message discipline from uh, the presumptive Republican nominee? Look, I'm not sure we need another reminder, but this is a reminder that Donald Trump may not be the highly disciplined political genius that he's being portrayed as in the press. Like he's he's still a shitty candidate. Right? Still a and, shitty candidate. Still doesn't know how to answer a question. What the the Hunter laptop? He it really is like he just knows that there are buzzwords he's supposed to hit. Like the laptop, the laptop's bad. You know what I'm hearing? That it's bad. There's a lot of money and there's a lot of corruption. And, you know, it's just very bad. It, I mean, it's so fascinating because he – we think of him as like deep into like MAGA fanfic conspiracy stuff, but he's not really that deep in it. He even skates the surface of Fox News. Like he knows – like you said, he knows the buzzwords, but he couldn't explain them to you, right? He doesn't even understand the bullshit part of it. He just knows, say laptop a bunch, say bleach bit, and it's – but he uses – this is the other reason why he's a bad candidate – is he uses language that is requires such to be so far down a rabbit hole to understand what you're talking about that it's just like to an average person that meant not even average person a average political junkie that meant nothing like it's just absolute nothing laptop bleach bit server email acid acid like what are we doing Andrew yeah, Andrew Jackson be treated very I've been no one's been treated like Trump in terms of very badly <laughs> I mean, not even Abraham Lincoln. Not even Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, I forgot about that one too. No, spoiler alert, but it didn't end great. <laughs> uh, so we talked on Tuesday's episode about um, Trump floating Medicare and Social Security cuts uh, on Wall Street's favorite cable news network. Uh, his campaign clearly realized how damaging that was because they got him to walk it back Thursday during a Breitbart interview. Um, one prominent Trump supporter who apparently didn't get the memo was Ben Shapiro whose take on the whole thing is that uh, people should literally work until they die. Let's listen. No one in the United States should be retiring at 65 years old. Frankly, I think retirement itself is a stupid idea unless you have some sort of health problem. Everybody that I know who is, who is elderly, who has retired, is dead within five years. And if you talk to people who are elderly and they lose their purpose in life by losing their job and they stop working, things go to hell in a handbasket real quick. <laughs> Look, I get, you take it from us. Being a podcaster, backbreaking work. But if Ben wants to, uh, you know, read underwear ads until his heart gives out, that, like, good on him. Uh, <laughs> other humans may want to spend their golden years with their family, their friends. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you're not a multimillionaire like Ben Shapiro is, you're going to need Social Security and Medicare. 
I personally wish that Donald Trump and all Republicans would just be honest and run on the Ben Shapiro, Paul Ryan, uh, work till you die platform. Yeah. And I mean, that's that is their platform. One hundred percent. It is Mike Johnson's platform. It is the platform of both white guys named John who want to replace Mitch McConnell. And it will be Donald Trump's platform if he is elected president. Like we that this election does come down to and we can talk about how you message it, but it does come down to if Donald Trump wins, he probably wins with a Republican House and a Republican Senate. And Social Security cuts and Medicare cuts are very much on the table. And if Joe Biden wins, then he will stop those cuts from happening. Full stop. That's all you need to know. Election over. Done. Are you telling me then when that when a Republican House and Senate send uh, President Donald Trump a budget with Social Security cuts and Medicare, he isn't going to go through that budget with a fine tooth comb, making sure that his campaign promise that he made to people about protecting Social Security and Medicare isn't fulfilled because he knows he's never going to have to face voters again? <laughs> well, here's how I know that that's not going to happen, because it's probably going to be his budget. Because the last time he was president, he put cuts to Social Security and Medicare in his budget every single year he was president. He made sure that did. exact same promise to not cut Social Security, Medicare, or even Medicaid, because at one point he confused Medicare and Medicaid, 2016. Then he tried to cut and eviscerate all three of those programs within like six months of being in the White House. So no, I do not take it seriously. <laughs> well, how do you think this is going to go? Because obviously... President Biden and the campaign have done a great job over the last couple of days, really hammering Trump on this. Biden uh, sort of uh, talked about it when he was in Wisconsin and Michigan during his events. Uh, now the Trump campaign walked it back and Trump's going to probably spend the rest of the campaign saying, oh, oh, I'll protect Medicare and Social Security no matter what. Uh, you think the best strategy here is for Biden and Democrats to just keep hammering him by pointing out what you just did, that it, it was in his budget for uh, the last four years? Yeah, it's in his budget that all the people of his party agree with him and want to do it. And that is an extension of the extremism that's taken over this Republican Party. So a couple of points on this. One is something that pollsters found in 2022 was there was always some hesitancy among voters to believe that a politician would actually cut Social Security and Medicare. Just that hasn't happened uh, for like almost a century. And so why would you believe it would happen now? But then after Dobbs, those ads started becoming more effective because once huh. Republican extremists take something away, that this seems all, everything's on the table if you're going to take constitutional rights away from people. And so that you saw people more open to Social Security and Medicare cuts. And, in, and while abortion was the topic in the most ads in 2022, not far behind that were cuts to Social Security and Medicare, particularly in Arizona, where Mark Kelly and the Super PAC supporting him ran a ton of ads against Blake Masters on that very issue. The second thing that's really important about how you talk about this is the reason Donald Trump and Republicans want to cut Social Security and Medicare is not just that they think people should work till they die and they hate government and they think it, we have lived in some sort of Darwinian hellscape where only the richest survive. It is because they need to pay for another $2 trillion tax cut that they are planning to pass at the end of 2025. The Trump tax for cuts ben For Ben Shapiro. So Ben yes, Shapiro can get tax another tax Shapiro, cut yes. and then he can just keep working and uh, not retire. So it's not just that they want to cut Social Security and Medicare, something unpopular. They want to cut it to pay for more tax cuts for corporations and the very wealthy. And so Donald Trump's going to lie about it. He has this, uh, at least in the immediate least, this imprimatur of he's a populist, a blue collar billionaire and all that. And that certainly works with this base. But we talked about this blueprint poll last week that looked at Donald Trump's vulnerabilities. Among working class voters, almost 50% of them cite Donald Trump cutting Social Security and Medicare as a top concern for why they don't want to be president. So there, people are open to this. Uh, and you just have to make the case and make sure people hear it. And you're going to face a lot of headwinds since Trump's going to lie about it. And the press is skeptical that these things would happen. But I, I love what the Biden campaign is doing. They should keep doing more of it for the next eight months. So I think it's very, it's, this was a very, very important moment in the campaign. And not only is the press skeptical, it's just very hard to get issues like this to break through because uh, all coverage, all political coverage is personality and culture wars and everything else. And, you know, it's not 2012 anymore where our, all the fights are about the size and role of government. Um, and so it's really hard to get coverage on Medicare and Social Security. And so as it, anyone who's listening, as you're volunteering, as you're talking to people in your life, like I realize it doesn't sound like the sexiest topic, especially if you're young, but someday we're going to need Social Security and Medicare too. And um, it is a very persuasive point to make to people that Republicans are going to cut Social Security and Medicare and, and that Joe Biden and Democrats will protect it. Very persuasive.
It's really fascinating because I I write message box newsletters on a lot of topics and I wrote on the social security one and you can almost feel the just the difference in engagement <laughs> and an open rate between something on social security and something on democracy or abortion. And part of the reason, I think this is a, there's a bias in the press that's sort of almost economic, which is when you look at these polls, the things that are mo- of most concern to the more politically engaged, college educated, upper income scale voters are, for Democrats particularly, is democracy, abortion, those sorts of things, which are incredibly important issues. But those are the people who are subscribing to the New York Times or the people who are watching MSNBC and CNN, people who maybe listen to this podcast. And it is on the issues for the people who are less politically engaged. This matters a lot. So you're going to have to, you need a lot of repetition to get it in front of those people. And yeah, and the upper income thing is is a real issue there too, because it's people yeah. who are not lying awake at night thinking, am I going to have to wait and retire at 75 or 80 because I don't know if I'm going to be able to get Social Security or Medicare. I mean, that is a real, it's a real issue. Or or be physically able to, to keep working. Yes. Right. right? Like, yes, because we're, we, can and also, po- we can podcast till we die and we probably will, <laughs> but that's different than if you do a job that requires physical labor, whereas you get older, that, that becomes harder. You have, you are older, but you also are taking on any injuries or damage that's been done. It's up to then. So it, like, that is what's so obnoxiously elitist about what Ben Shapiro said, which is just so ironic coming from how the right likes to portray themselves. Now, here's here's an issue that uh, I bet would get some engagement. Um, we know that pardoning insurrectionists ain't all that popular. Uh, <laughs> So I think it's like 70% of voters I uh, saw a CBS poll around the uh, anniversary of January 6th this year. Uh, 70% of voters think that uh, people convicted of violently assaulting police officers shouldn't get to skip their prison sentence, though they didn't ask the question like that. I bet if you asked it like that, you'd get uh, even higher than 70%. Um, just so people remember, at least 140 police officers were wounded. Rioters had guns, knives, tasers, baseball bats, flagpoles. Um, most of the prosecutions focused on people who, who had committed violent uh, assault around January 6th, not just people, not the peaceful protesters that Republicans talk about, not people who just wandered into the Capitol even, but the people who were violent on January 6th who caused people harm. And now Donald Trump says on the first day of his presidency, he wants to let these people out of prison and pardon them. Imagine ignoring them. Like, what, what would they do next? Like, why would they worry about committing political violence when uh, the guy who just pardoned them for committing political violence is in the White House. Yeah, the guy, the guy who incited them then pardoned them. So why wouldn't they do who will incite them again? Like, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, and I get that the uh, that there are limits to the democracy argument. You really have to make it tangible for people. I think that Trump wanting to pardon insurrectionists is one of those ways to make it real to people. And I think that it, I actually think it could be a real salient issue, but I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, 100 percent agree. I think January 6th is a very, very salient issue because a lot of the democracy arguments are very, very valid and important, but they're about the esoteric notion of a functioning political system and norms. And this is about a group of people who violently try to overthrow the government, getting pardons from the person who asked them to violently overthrow the government. It is an example of it reminds people what they like least about Trump. It reminds you of the tremendous dangerous extremism of them, the chaos. And so, yeah, absolutely should be should be talked about. Mark Esper, who was Trump's uh, defense secretary towards the end, who then he ended up firing. Uh, he was on MSNBC this week and he said that, like, Donald Trump suggested that the military shoot Americans in the streets to him. This is a guy who was defense secretary for Donald Trump. Is now saying, hey, I, I wasn't defense secretary anymore. And I just want to tell everyone uh, the president was telling telling us that the military should shoot Americans in the streets who were protesting. What are we doing? <laughs> you know what? The next defense secretary? More yeah. likely to go along with it. If Trump well, I was going to say, yeah, not going to make that mistake twice. Um, all right. So Trump and Republicans are also trying to figure out how to sneak their national abortion ban past voters uh kellyanne conway was out there this week giving her party advice on how to talk about the issue uh at a politico event she said republicans should ditch their line about democrats supporting abortion quote up until the moment of birth because 
Uh, go figure. Not a lot of people actually believe that happens because it doesn't happen. The National Republican Congressional Committee also put out a memo this week urging Republican candidates, quote, to express empathy for women in order to fix their, quote, brand problem. Uh, but alas, Kellyanne also admitted that Trump is, in fact, considering a national ban. I'll tell you what. Do you think Trump should come out for a 15-week ban? I, well, it's a national minimum standard, and uh, it's not a ban. And um, he has said, I think he's told Sean Hannity a couple weeks ago when they were at the border, he was looking at that. He's also said 16 weeks or four months. <laughs> it's a na- what, what is she calling it? A national, a limiting- national minimum standard. A national minimum standard. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. What it means is if you're a state that has banned abortion at six weeks or banned abortion completely, that, that ban stays. But blue states or states that haven't put any restrictions on abortion yet, they would all have to be 15 weeks. So yeah, it's a national ban. Uh, 15 weeks in some places, six weeks in others. Yeah. Uh, Do you think it's possible for Republicans to speak about this in a way that uh, actually helps them deal with this political problem? I'm doubtful, but what do you think? No, absolutely not. The problem is not their language. The problem is the problem, right? It's their position, right? They have a a Republican-appointed Supreme Court took a constitutional right away from more than half the country, and then a bunch of Republican legislators then pass these onerous bills, in many cases with no exceptions for rape, incest, or the health or life of the mother. And so that's the problem, right? It's not 15 weeks. It's not showing more empathy. It's not any of that. You have adopted an incredibly unpopular position at a time that has caused a massive electoral coalition shifting backlash in this country. And so this is where political consultants are totally full of shit, right? There is no language, right? You can either be on the right side of the issue and win elections and be on the wrong side of the issue and keep losing them. And that is full stop. That's the whole deal. Yeah. I mean, a Republican tried this in a big campaign. It was Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. He, uh, in the legislative elections in Virginia, and he tried to campaign in a 15 week ban and a bunch of anti-abortion groups called it uh, a roadmap for how to tackle abortion. Uh, and he lost, they lost Republicans lost that campaign. And the reason they lost is because people didn't focus on the number of weeks or when or people focused on the idea that politicians were trying to tell women and their doctors what decisions they should make about their health. And what they what they didn't want is for politicians to get in the way of that. And they didn't want the government to step in and say, we get to decide and we get to litigate what you do with your body. And the idea that, you know, 15 weeks is going to save them once there might have been an argument for that before Dobbs politically. But I think you're you know, you're right. As soon as Dobbs happened and we heard these stories, these horrific stories all around the country, people realized 15 weeks, 20 weeks, six weeks, whatever. Just let me make the decision. You know, uh, Conway thinks Republicans should challenge Democrats to lay out the specifics of their own abortion views. I believe she phrased it. Um, Show me your exceptions and I'll show you mine. (laughs) Meaning like Republicans are willing because, you know, she wants Trump and Trump's been saying this to say, oh, I'm for exceptions, rape, incest, life of the mother. And so now she wants Republicans to turn around to Democrats and say, "Okay, what are your exceptions? How do you think Democrats should handle that? Um, I'm even confused by her question. Like, what is she talking about? Like she wants Democrats to be like, oh, so, okay, you don't want 15 weeks. Do you want 24 weeks? Do you want 30 weeks? What are you for 22 weeks? What how many weeks would you be for? What if we just pass the bill, the Senate, the Women's Health Protection Act that Senate Democrats have pledged to and President Biden have pledged to pass and sign into law if they get enough Democrats to get rid of the filibuster? What if we just did that? What if we just returned to the to the way of life before Dobbs? Yeah, I don't think you fall into that trap because I think (laughs) the, the, the principle is that uh, women should get to make decisions about uh, starting a family and when to have a family with their doctor. That's it. It is a personal medical decision and Republicans should stay out of it. And the reason that people are uh, the reason that Republicans keep losing on this is because no one believes they're going to stop at 15. They uh, they've, you know, in Alabama, the Supreme Court went after IVF. Uh, Some of them are trying to go after contraception. It's like, just keep politicians out of people's medical decisions unless the politicians are trying to make decisions that are going to guarantee access to affordable health care. That's the only time politicians should be involved in people's health care. 
<laughs> yeah. Politicians should get you into the doctor's office and then they should close the door and leave. <laughs> right. Exactly. They should not stay and, and, be, and advise you on the, and not mandate what it is you can and can't do when you're in that room with your doctor. So Democrats are, of course, trying to keep abortion in the news. Uh, yesterday, Kamala Harris visited an abortion clinic in Minnesota run by Planned Parenthood, something no sitting vice president or president has ever done. Uh, here's Harris answering a question about whether Democrats can succeed in restoring the protections of Roe v. Wade. Well, Congress will pass that bill when we win back the House. Yes. And so um, I am sure of that. One of the points that must be made on this issue as we attempt to uplift the real stories and the real consequences of the Dobbs decision is to remind people elections matter. Uh, what did you think of that move going to uh, an abortion clinic? I loved it. I think it was incredibly smart. It is, you know, as we know, when abortion is top of mind, it helps Democrats win elections because that is what is at stake. Right. And we cannot let it. You know, we every day is one day further from Dobbs. Every day, Republicans are getting a tiny bit smarter about not saying their real positions on abortion or even just trying to avoid talking about it. So it's going to be incumbent upon Democrats to keep it in the news. So talking about it is good. And it is a real sign of the White House and the Biden folks thinking creatively about how to get attention for the things they're saying. Let's say she just did that at a women's roundtable in Wisconsin yeah. or somewhere else. We're not talking about it. It's not on the news. No, it's in the news locally, which is good, but it's not getting into the national online conversation. And so doing things like this, going to places that are controversial, they're going to cause the Republicans to react to it, to create controversy and conflict, means people will hear her message and remind them that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the Democrats are going to fight for reproductive freedom and access to abortion. The Republicans want to take it away. So I think it was, it was great they did it. It was bold. It was smart. And I think it was quite effective. Yeah, I also think it shows that Joe Biden and his White House and his campaign and Kamala Harris um, are not afraid to put abortion front and center nope. <laughs> um, by going to an abortion clinic. Yeah. And look, I, I say this because there's been a few stories about how um, some reproductive rights activists are angry with Biden for saying words like choice and row instead of the word abortion. Um, and you know, I guess he didn't stay, say the word abortion in the State of the Union, even though he started the State of the Union by talking about abortion and and urging Congress to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. Um, and I totally understand the argument that prominent public figures saying the word abortion could help lessen the stigma around getting an abortion, which is a very important thing to do. But one thing I would urge everyone to remember is the abortion rights movement didn't win in red states like Kansas and Ohio and Kentucky by speaking only to people who favor no restrictions on abortion. They won by persuading people who some people who are uncomfortable with abortion uh, or even personally opposed that politicians shouldn't get to make that choice for people. And look, now we have an 81 year old Catholic guy as president who's never been a personal fan of abortion but opened his State of the Union by promising to stake his political capital on guaranteeing access to abortion nationwide. And to do that, he's going to need to convince people who feel the same way he does. And like that is that is just democracy. That is how we accumulate the power necessary to make sure that we don't just have a president who says the word abortion, but a president who has the ability and the power to actually make abortion uh, legal in every single state of the country. And I think that most people who who want an abortion would rather that. Right. There is zero political downside or risk in saying the word abortion. It doesn't make your position more radical. It doesn't. Everyone knows what you're talking about, right? It's mm -hmm. like when you run the ads. Also about very true. Trump. And then you just don't say his name or when Republicans try to subtweet him back in the day. Now, now they just all uh, tweet in support of him um, like that. That's dumb. What? It, a different president, maybe a younger president, maybe President Elizabeth Warren or President Kamala Harris, to pick two people who ran against him, would probably be more comfortable and more bold and aggressive in talking about abortion than Joe Biden is. But Joe Biden is our president. What I mean, I just you worked on a thousand state of the unions. We've watched a million of them. I just can't tell you how far the party has come that our 81 year old Catholic president use the first five minutes of his State of the Union to call for passing a law to restore Roe. Like that is a gigantic progress. 
Would it be better if he felt more comfortable talking about it in bolder ways? Great. But he is he is our president. He is our nominee. And if a Democratic House and Democratic Senate send him a bill, he will happily, proudly sign it. And that is just a gigantic deal. And so is there more work to do to get more politicians to be more comfortable? With it? Absolutely. But have, have we come at a, a huge distance in a short period of time because of Dobbs? Yes. And is Joe Biden going to do the right thing here? He absolutely will. And again, it's just it, it's really not about defending Joe Biden or not. If you want to be mad about no. it, Joe Biden, but that's fine, you know. But as you are out there persuading voters, know you are going to run into some people who may be personally opposed to abortion, may call undocumented immigrants illegal immigrants, like Joe Biden did in the State of the Union, and then later said he wished to use the word undocumented. And the point of campaigning is to meet people where they are, but then not leave them there. And so if you stop by like scolding people for it, um, then you're going to turn off the conversation when you, instead you could actually persuade them to get to a better place and to like, again, join this coalition that we're trying to build to stop Donald Trump. Um, all right, let's talk about the vice president's running mate, jacked up Joe Biden, who's been on offense since the State of the Union. Uh, this week, he visited two must-win Midwestern states, Wisconsin, where he opened a campaign headquarters in Milwaukee and Michigan, where he campaigned in the diverse city of Saginaw. The president talked about all the infrastructure jobs he's made possible, his plans to lower housing costs, uh, and he hit Trump as a loser who wants to cut your retirement benefits. The polls, however, still haven't moved all that much since the State of the Union though it's only been a week, uh, Trump is still up two points, uh, around two points in the polling averages, and the uh, 538 swing state averages show Trump up everywhere, ranging from almost uh, eight points in Georgia to less than a point in Pennsylvania. I won't even go through the individual polls. There have been quite a few in the last three days, some high quality, some lower quality, some national, some swing state, all bad. <laughs> <laughs> mostly bad mostly bad i will say not all, he, was, not say, he was he was up to in the ipsos poll uh anyway where's the bounce dan you promised <laughs> us a bounce you do this show polar coaster that everyone can sign up crooked.com slash friends listen to dan on polar coaster uh but where's the bounce <laughs> anyone who thought <laughs> and i know you didn't think this is that an attack because yeah, i said you. it you were, i, I said it you the were night of the state of the union i said i don't remember what i said because i was it was pretty tired. <laughs> you were doing your best Chuck Todd impersonation right there, but it was like, that's unfair to Chuck. Chuck would not have done that. But anywho, <laughs> anyone who thought that Joe Biden was going to get a significant bounce out of one speech seen by 30 million people should be suspended from talking, writing, tweeting, tooting, threading, or skeeting about politics for six <laughs> weeks. Like it's just, it was never going to happen because just think about this, right? Joe Biden has 100% name ID. He's been president for almost four years. He was vice president for eight years. He's with the national scene before that. He's in a race against a person who was president four years ago, also has 100% name ID. And it's not just people know their names. The depth of knowledge of these two candidates is unlike anything in any race in modern history. So right. were you saying if, it's too early to pay attention to the polls then because they're between... uh, no, I'm absolutely not saying I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> what I'm saying two is two people with 100 percent name ID who everyone knows. <laughs> yes. But the point well, the, the point I'm trying to make is in a time of polarization, Barack Obama did not get say the union bounces. That was not a thing that happened. Then. Just like I said, just yeah. in 2009. That was it. We live in a time of polarization. Most people have made up their minds. 30 million people is a lot of a lot of people to watch that speech. It's still a fraction of the electorate. And you assume that most of those people who watch it have already made up their mind, right? That's just who, that's who tunes into a speech. But the way that campaign operatives think about this is the horse race moves last. Approval ratings move second to last. What moves first is the, the polling questions about that, are, that we call them the, the underneath questions, right? Character, strength. And for Joe Biden, the critical question right now is, do voters think he is too old to do the job? And there's evidence in a morning consult poll that voters, the number of voters who thought that Joe Biden was too old to do the job went down after the speech. They polled pre-speech and they polled post-speech. And the bulk of that change happened among Democrats and Biden's 2020 voters, which is exactly how you would expect this race to go, which is Biden is underperforming against Trump right now because he's getting about 85 percent of people who voted for him in 2020. And Trump is getting 97% in the New York Times poll of people who voted for him in 2020. And so that's the low-hanging fruit for Biden, are people who have actually pulled the lever for him before, or new voters who agree with him 
ideologically on almost every issue, right? Abortion, climate change, LGBTQ rights, uh, tax cuts for the wealthy, protecting Social Security. And those are the people you move first. You move them first by showing that this big giant concern that has been hovering over the race for months is not as big a concern as people may have thought. So I think there's very, what we've seen in the polling suggests that things are moving in the right direction for Biden. They're just going to move more slowly than most people want them to move. Yeah. And I also think a couple things on polling. It's always tough because polling is a uh, lagging indicator. And so uh, those of us who are very involved in politics and pay close attention, um, we, you know, wait for a couple of days and we're like, well, how can someone not have formed an opinion on the State of the Union already? Because didn't we are just watch it. But almost all the time, uh, changes in polling happen like two or three or four weeks later. It's just like because most people like didn't watch the State of the Union and didn't really like get into the coverage all that much and just maybe just heard about it later from a friend. But I also think what's going to be maybe more effective, what's definitely going to be more effective than the, just the State of the Union, which, you know, a lot of people didn't watch is the ad campaign, right? They're just li- the ad campaign in the swing states. And uh, that has really started in earnest, especially as the contrast uh, the ad we talked about on, on Tuesday's pod. So uh, lots of time left. But, you know, again, don't freak out about the polls. Don't dismiss them either. Uh, use them like campaigns do, which is not to um, which is to understand what voters' concerns are and and how all of us, uh, not just the Biden campaign, can address those concerns and persuade people to vote for Biden. That's the that is the use of polling, <laughs> not for predictive purposes. Uh, so no no cross tab truthers here. Uh, what does the uh, message and geography of the first few stops tell you about their strategy? Wisconsin, Michigan, Kamala was in Minnesota, and Biden was in Georgia last week. Right, right, right. On Tuesday. Um, Obviously, the campaign is going to be primarily focused on the six battleground states, um, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. I think one of the sense you're getting both from the issue choices and some of these last few visits is that the primary focus, the most important states, the states he cannot afford to lose, are the three states that make up the so-called blue wall. Not really a blue wall, thanks to 2016, but Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and that you're going to see a lot of th- a lot of focus there, a lot of time there, a lot of spending there, and a lot of focus on economic issues. And that's it's notable that that's where he has been delivering this hit on Social Security, and Medicare, and so I think that is that's sort of what it, what it says is really the campaign is off and running now. Like this, the starting gun was the State of the Union. We are now campaigning. We're running ads. We're going to battleground states, opening campaign headquarters in Milwaukee, um, and doing a lot. So we are we are uh, off and running for with and only eight months to go. Less of a blue wall, more like a, a blue fence, like a, a mesh fence. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's uh, not really. It's not. not it's like sturdy right now. It's one of you know those those invisible electrical fences uh, <laughs> for which I think you're probably not supposed to use for animals. And maybe the battery works on the collar we put on Trump. Maybe it doesn't. We don't know. Yes, yeah, definitely doesn't. Um, yeah. All right. Well, on the same week that Biden and Trump uh, sewed up their nominations, the potential third party spoilers also made some news. Uh, no labels announced that they formed a nominating committee to select their candidate, Joe Lieberman. Joe Lieberman, back in our lives. Uh, He said that they could announce as early as March 21st. That's next week. Um, But that they'll still only move forward, he said, if they think they have a real chance to win because they don't want to reelect Donald Trump. Uh, Meanwhile, their national co-chair, former North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory, quit the group. To you guessed it, spend more time with his family, lost another one, lost Larry Hogan because <laughs> he's running for Senate. Pat McCrory's gone. They're just losing people left and right there. Um, then there's RFK Jr. Uh, so we talked on I talked with Jane Coaston on Wednesday's pod about um, uh, RFK Jr. floating Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers as his running mate. Uh, Kennedy later confirmed that he will be announcing his VP pick on March 26th in Oakland, California. Rogers played college football in nearby Berkeley. Turns out Rogers also told CNN's Pamela Brown a few years ago that the Sandy Hook massacre was actually carried out by the U.S. government as a false flag operation. Unfucking real. Uh, hours after CNN broke the story, Kennedy was asked about Rogers during a Fox News interview. Here's what he said. Aaron Rodgers is battle tested. He's uh, he stood up. He's been hammered by the press. 
stood up for things we believed in. I like that part of his character. He's a critical thinker, and I think we need that at the time as, you know, the rise of AI. We need people who understand that you cannot always trust authority just because somebody's in charge. When I think of the rise of AI and the dangers of artificial intelligence, I think there's only one person who can help us through this. That's Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. Uh, can I get oh, your thoughts man. on the possibility of a Kennedy Rogers tickets, which seems like it... I I thought it was a parody at first. I didn't I didn't believe it, and now it's it seems like he's maybe the top of the list. I mean, I just the guy <laughs> has to report to Jets training camp in four months. Like I don't understand how this is going to work. Is he not going to play football? Is he going to retire from football to be the VP of Robert Kennedy? Do we think it's possible that like he his Achilles injury? Like it was just like the the surgery, and everything, everything was just he didn't recover and as well as he thought he would. And he doesn't want to do this other. Se- so he's like, you know what? I'm just going to use this as a way out. I don't think that's the case because he was I've seen mo- a lot of footage of him throwing footballs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were f- it's kind of ridiculously floating the day he was going to come back for the playoffs, which is a really brave thing to say when the Jets are six and ten or whatever they were. So it's like I, too, will play in the playoffs. <laughs> so it's like, um. No, I, I I, mean, it's worth remembering that Aaron Rodgers, in the midst of coming off his MVP season as quarterback, spent an entire summer trying to become the host of Jeopardy. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's all. That's just like reading questions off a cart, you know? That's not running for president. Well, I'm, I'm just saying the guy seems to be having a crisis of some kind. <laughs> He's looking for meaning in his life. You think so? <laughs> so you think so? Yeah, I'm getting the sense well, it seems that football like it's just not some, doing it for him. It feels, seems like it's been for some time since it was a couple of years ago that he was at the Kentucky Derby with Pam Brown and told her, oh, by the way, Sandy Hook? Yeah, total false flag operation. That's yeah. Hey, Pam and my, Brown. My buddy Alex Jones told me this. Where's this information been? I mean, I guess he wasn't. I mean, she probably thought that he because he's not potentially a vice presidential candidate. Me, <laughs> I mean, he's been spreading COVID misinformation yeah. on podcasts uh, well, all over the world for well, years now. Well, now we know. Now we know. But I would say just as a political matter, this would be great news for Democrats. I think it is doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on fucking weirdos. Can, RF, <laughs> RFK Jr. <laughs> anti-vaccine conspiracy theorist yeah right and it also it just seems fucking ridiculous and that's the best thing and a sandy hook truther not only is it just fucking morally repugnant in like it makes me sick thinking about people saying that but it's all like most people are gonna think that's way fucking crazier than vaccine skepticism or vaccine and or even full anti-vax right unfortunately but like pe- like saying that these these children like crisis actors i mean the shit that alex jones was sued for and, and lost for like millions and millions of dollars for this for this def- defaming these poor families and like what is what the fuck is aaron Rodgers running around spreading that bullshit for I mean, even if he was Anthony Fauci's intern and a spokesperson for Pfizer, no one thinks that the quarterback of the Jets should be fucking vice president of the United States. Like, that is an absurd notion. Uh, well, OK. Well, Donald Trump is, you know, he was president for four years. Might be yeah, but at least, he, for at least he pretended to be a businessman for a half century. Like, this is – it is. You, know, you remember – I know this, it's, we have to go back deep into our memory holes here. But you remember that Kanye West was on the ballot in 2020? Mm, I do. I do. There is a level of ridiculousness that voters are not going to abide by. And Jer- <laughs> I think Aaron Rodgers being on the ticket is part of that. And if the if people were like, well, he was the quarterback of the of the Green Bay Packers and Green Bay's in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin's a swing state. I was like, I'm just – this is – Aaron Rodgers stealing Wisconsin from Joe Biden is a low on my list of concerns. <laughs> <laughs> that that Fox interview that where Kennedy's talking about him, he goes on to say like, and you know it's important for someone young to be on the ticket because he's only forty. And then he also said, and and I think he's going to help me get America healthy again. I think that's 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 why I'm really excited. He's going to help people get healthy again. I'm like, why yeah, is Aaron, Aaron Rodgers a spokesperson for ayahuasca? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's Aaron Rodgers. We'll find out yeah. a week from now. I don't know. Soon. I can. I honestly cannot wait for what's going to happen because the backup choices are also amazing. It's not like it's Aaron Rodgers and then like a state legislator. Oh yeah, we haven't even talked about. Yeah, it could be a <laughs> Jesse Ventura or Mike Rowe, Discovery Channel host. I have some real. It's interesting yeah. people on that list. Uh, so the no labels thing sounded like news until I realized that it was just basically the announcement of a future announcement. Though then Lieberman did say uh, March twenty first, as early as March twenty first. So. Um, 
What what's going on there? What's they've gone from a they were going to have like a a nominating convention in person to a Zoom convention to now it's just a small committee picking people. They've been turned down by a whole bunch of people. Like who is left? Who is left? I'm so interested to see who they end up going with here. Maybe Aaron Rodgers if he doesn't make the. Oh if Jesus Christ! Cut. I didn't think I mean, about that. I, who like I, I don't know. I'm trying to think who the if Aaron Rodgers is the RFK junior football player, who the no labels football player would be. I don't even want to. Yeah, I don't even, not even, it's, a, it's a different, it's a terminally online subject is my guess. Um, <laughs> it, I assume they just want to keep this thing going so that the people at no labels can continue to suck as much money as possible from politically naive billionaires. <laughs> yeah, that maybe. seems like the most likely case. Cause the idea, Joe Lieberman, ridiculous human being that he is, we're not going to do if we can't win. Read the fucking constitution. You can't win. <laughs> you cannot win. If you do not get to 270 electoral votes, it goes to the house. How many no labels party members are currently in the house? <laughs> like what? Do, like it's just, it is. An I know. Absurd I don't I, proposition. No one has told me what the fucking plan is here. <laughs> there. I mean, just the amount of absurd PowerPoints presented to people Apparently smart enough to make a billion dollars on Wall Street, but not smart enough to understand the most basic, fundamental schoolhouse rocks versions of politics. You just which we should tell there. you something about how much smarts it takes to be rich. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so let me tell you. Maybe let it's a right brain, left brain thing. I don't know. But not sending their best. The wealthy. No, <laughs> not sending their best. <laughs> Are, so would you say that you're more or less worried about no labels than you were a month ago? I am less worried. I mean, talk to me on March 21st when they roll yeah. out some ticket, but the, they roll out the rock. Larry Hogan, <laughs> Kirsten, Sin- like all the names with have been floated to us. Larry Hogan, Kirsten Cinema, Joe Manchin. That was more worrisome than a person we've never heard of. Lieutenant this, Governor have- Jeff Duncan from Georgia. That was, one of those is, is that a choice? That, yeah, they thought that, that, that yeah, they, they they floated him and they said he might be interested. He was the lieutenant governor under Kemp. I don't know if he's still the lieutenant governor, but he's like anti-Trump, but still pretty conservative anyway. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I'm still worried about it only because every single place that is a way station for Biden voters in 2020 who are unhappy with Joe Biden, who don't want to cross the Rubicon to vote for Trump. Like we need this to be a choice between either you over Joe Biden and Joe Biden's president, you vote for Donald Trump or a third party candidate and Donald Trump is president. Right. And if people have a place, every place there is for a protest vote makes it easier for Donald Trump to win. So I remain worried, maybe a little bit less worried, but still worried. Yeah, me too. When we come back, Tommy talks to EPA administrator Michael Regan. Joining us now to talk about President Biden's record on climate change, clean air, clean water, so much more is EPA administrator Michael Regan. Thank you for being here. Hey, it's exciting to be here. What do we call you? Uh, administrator? Uh, I'll answer to anything as long as it's not derogatory. Okay. I like that. I like (laughs) that very much. I like that a lot. Okay. So one of the issues that our audience cares about the most is climate change. Um, can you just give us like the kind of overview of what the administration has done to combat climate change, what you'd like to accomplish if president Biden gets another four years Mm -hmm. and then how the EPA fits into those efforts? Yeah, I think I'm really proud of the way the president has tackled climate change. And, you know, I think when you look at the historic legislation that's been passed, uh, the president has worked uh, considerably in a bipartisan way uh, to create, uh, you know, billions of dollars to invest in where we see the private sector already going. Mm -hmm. So this is an acceleration opportunity to reduce pollution, but also to create jobs and invest in infrastructure. Uh, EPA is at the center of that. You know, our, our goal is to protect public health Uh, and the environment. And so traditionally, our agency through regulations uh, look at ways to provide certainty to the private sector in the market so that they can make longer term investments uh, for the good of their business model, but also for the good of the planet. This time around, uh, the president has given what I like to call us a little bit of walking around money. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a couple of billion dollars now that we can invest in the industries that we're also regulating. So it's a little bit of a stick and a carrot. I think that's emblematic of the president's uh, vision for how government should work, public-private partnerships. It's the most aggressive investment in combating the climate crisis in United States history. So I'm excited to be on the team, and I'm really excited about EPA's role in the president's vision. And hey, I'm looking forward to getting eight years 
um, because I think we've done a tremendous amount in the first three years, but we've got a story to tell. We've got to ensure that the American people understand that these historic investments that are being made are for the long haul. Yeah. So the the IRA passed about a year and a half ago. At the time, analysts predicted that the tax credits, the investments in the bill uh, in clean tech would cut greenhouse gas emissions to about 40% below the 2005 levels by the year 2030. So there's some outside groups that track progress in implementation of the IRA. Um, they say that despite some of the headlines out there, the uh, electric vehicle sales are actually on target and doing well. But efforts to get more carbon-free electricity into the electric grid are behind schedule. Is that right? And, and if, if that's the case, how do we fix it? You know, I think it's about right. Um, you know, when you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, it's such a massive piece of legislation. And you're talking about investing billions of dollars into infrastructure projects. Right. Some of those projects are on time. Um, and some of those projects are requiring a little bit more cooperation between state, local, and federal governments to make that investments. And bureaucracies can take a little longer. Permitting stuff, Permitting, new lines. Uh, getting uh, you know municipalities to find matching funds for some of the federal dollars. Um, but also, you know, some states who want this money to reduce carbon having to deal with their state legislatures who want to turn away money or do things for political reasons mm. solely. Sounds familiar from the uh, Obamacare administration. Yeah, <laughs> Exactly. Turning down you know, free money to uh, Different topic, the same yeah. playbook. Um, and, and listen, I, I think uh, no matter where you live, um, you know, you're seeing your state invest in the future, newer technologies, newer business models to reduce climate uh, pollution. And it's, it's just like we have a Climate Reduction Pollution Grant Program, CPRG. And this is about $4.6 billion where states can draw up their own plan and compete for federal funds to reduce climate change. And, you know, you see these legislators and congressional representatives in the other party constantly say climate change is false and fake. But you can go to our website right now and you'll see Alabama, Alaska, state plans, asking for these dollars to combat the climate crisis. And they're doing that because they want the money because they want the battery manufacturers in their states. They want the clean technologies because they know that's how you recruit a younger workforce. So what's playing out through the rhetoric in Washington, D.C. isn't actually playing out in the, on the ground. And the president knows that. He sees right through it. And he pledged from day one that he'd be a president for everybody. And I think if you look at some of the historic legislation and where the resources are going, uh, just as many resources are going to red states as they are to blue states. The uh, first trip I ever went on at the White House was to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Mm. Uh, and the guy who worked for Bob Gates, his press guy, was like, hey, come have lunch with us. So we sat down and he was like, how are you liking the job? And I didn't know what to say. And I was like, a lot of acronyms, sir. That was the only thing I could think to say. <laughs> and he started laughing. He's like, man, I, even I don't know what they're talking about half the time, but I'm the boss, so they have to explain them to me when I pause. So we need an <laughs> acronym reduction act. We'll work on that after. Uh, uh, so a couple months ago, the Supreme Court uh, heard oral arguments over an issue called the Chevron defense or the Chevron mm -hmm. doctrine. Basically, the idea is federal agencies should be allowed to interpret the law to set regulations because they're experts while Congress and the courts are not. I think anyone that has watched Congress or the Supreme Court debate social media, for example, mm -hmm. we'll, uh, we'll get it. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people are worried that if the court overturns Chevron, it could fundamentally undercut the, the government's ability to regulate stuff, uh, in particular your agency. What do you think a, a Chevron, a scenario where Chevron is overturned would mean for the EPA? You know, it's something that we are obviously watching very closely. I, I think the majority of Americans uh, think that Congress got it right. Uh, they give agencies discretion because agencies are the experts. And, you know, uh, some of the court decisions that we're seeing as of late, uh, in my view, restrict agencies from doing what they are, you know, tasked to do. We have the mission, we have the expertise. So when you look at uh, the, the cases like Chevron and others, um, without me predicting where I think they will land, uh, you really put a chill in the market because as the regulator, 
uh, we've been doing this for since 1970. Most industry knows where we're going to land in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And we work hand in hand with our stakeholders, whether it be communities or the industry and the private sector. And so when you have a court uh, like uh, what happened with um, uh, you know, our, a Clean Water Act case, when you have the courts reverse 50 years of precedence, right. uh, that not only hurts the agency's ability to protect water quality or, or air quality or whatever topic it may be, but it also upsets the apple cart for the predictability that we provide for, for industry. So, you know, we're seeing some some decisions at the Supreme Court level that obviously we disagree with. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to find a way to protect public health, protect the environment, protect water quality, and make sure that every single person in this country uh, has a clean and healthy place to live. Yeah, I mean, I, I was looking at some of these cases. There's uh, the Supreme Court is considering uh, a request to block the EPA's Good Neighbor Plan, which basically tries to prevent interstate pollution, you know, one state dumping a bunch of pollution mm -hmm. downstream to another. They've gone after your ability to regulate power plant emissions, uh, to protect wetlands. I mean, are the courts becoming the biggest impediment to the mission of the EPA? You know, we're having to, uh, I'd like to say we're having to um, measure twice and cut once, meaning we have to spend a lot more time uh, just ensuring that our decisions are durable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the interpretations that we used to have for our statutory authority, obviously the courts are taking a different tact. And so we're having to adjust to that. That's slowing down progress. Uh, that is also creating uncertainty in the markets because now even, uh, you know, industry and those we regulate uh, may agree with some of our decisions, and we're both seeing them overturned in the courts. We're seeing fewer uh, pesticides being able to hit the markets. Um, you know, Waters of the U.S. Uh, is another Supreme Court decision that has really created some chaos on the ground in terms of local permitting and decisions around clean water. Uh, West Virginia versus EPA is sort of that uh, decision around power plants that really slowed down where the private sector was already going. You know, the interesting thing about the West Virginia versus EPA case is the Supreme Court uh, evaluated a rule that never took effect. Hmm. And so industry was already anticipating that this rule was going to go in a certain direction. So they made massive investments. The rule that the Supreme Court, the rule that never took effect, that the Supreme Court took time to evaluate, actually achieved less emission reductions than what happened in reality. Hmm. So we focused on a rule that never took effect that was not as uh, ambitious as what is happening in, in reality. Uh, I, I just think that the courts um, should really focus on the things that matter and not really play into what seems to be a political temperature that is guiding some of these decisions. Yeah. Um, back on, on climate change for a sec. So Cutting methane emissions is key to combating climate change because methane traps in way more heat than carbon dioxide. Methane also breaks down faster in the atmosphere. I think it's like 12 years as opposed to centuries for CO2, which just sits up there. So for listeners, long story short, if we cut methane emissions fast, it'll have a big impact. Mm -hmm. um, some of those reductions will come from fixing leaky oil and gas infrastructure. Some will come from livestock management. Um, which is where this conversation can get very stupid. Um, here is a quick clip from a guy named Larry Kudlow. He's a financial news commentator uh, and former Trump aide. Get this. America has to stop eating meat, stop eating poultry, fish, seafood, eggs, dairy, and animal-based fats. Okay, we got that? No burgers on July 4th. No steaks on the Barbie. I'm sure middle America is just going to love that. Can you grill those Brussels sprouts? So get ready. You can throw back a plant-based beer with your grilled Brussels sprouts and wave your American flag. Call it July 4th green. Setting aside the fact that it sounds like Larry Kudlow is drinking meat-based beer, <laughs> um, that's weird. Uh, you do hear this nonsense a lot. Uh, can you address the the people who think that Joe Biden wants to ban hamburgers. Is that in the cards? It's, it's just completely ridiculous. Um, number one, EPA doesn't have the legal authority to regulate animals. 
uh, in in this way from a methane standpoint. So we have no desire to do that. It's not on the table. Um, and, you know, society is just a victim of a lot of misinformation. Uh, when you really look at what President Biden is doing on the issue of methane, what he has done is he's tasked EPA to develop a technology standard that, by the way, the majority of the natural gas industry has signed on to do. And we're actually using uh, technology ranging from ro robotic dogs to the Environmental Defense Fund, a, a national nonprofit just launched a $100 million satellite into space to monitor methane. They can see the leaks, right? They can see the leaks all over the world in real time. So the industry said to us, hey, we need a regulation that creates a fair competition for all of us to reduce our methane emissions at the same time because... Organizations like EDF and, um, and, and community groups have more access to information. So give us something that we all can rally around. And, and we did that. Uh, we're leading the, 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 the world in some of these technology standards. So we're focused on the realities of leveraging technology standards and new business models to tackle pollution. By the way, I think the industry would even agree that if you can detect a leak and plug that leak you're actually saving product, mm -hmm. which saves them money, right? Right. That's too rational for Larry to grab onto. He'd much rather focus on cows and other uh, things like, I guess you said it best, meat-based beer. Maybe meat -based he's drinking meat-based beer. And uh, everyone in middle America says uh, steaks on the Barbie. That's very uh, <laughs> common, I think. So what's the plan here? Is we giving cows some tums or some sort of an acid? Like, what, is there an actual, is there a fix to methane release from livestock or is it just over time changing habits? Uh, from, from my position at EPA, um, because I don't regulate cows for methane reasons and I enjoy a good steak uh -huh. and hamburgers, I just would like for cows to live happy and do what they're doing. Okay, do what they're doing. Maybe, uh, yeah, don't go out on Friday nights and feel <laughs> a little better. So um, the president has talked a lot about replacing lead pipes, including during a State of the Union address. There are probably some listeners who are thinking, Tommy, why are you asking about pipe maintenance? I'm already bored. But <laughs> this is a big deal. And I was just wondering if you could give folks kind of the overview of why getting rid of these lead pipes is so important. Number one, we know that there is absolutely no acceptable level of lead exposure. We have about 9 million um, people in this country that are exposed to lead in their drinking water. It's a scary thing when you think about our children being lead poisoned, not only does it create physical ailments for them, but it impacts cognitive ability and really can undercut uh, what their potential is as individuals in this country. And so the president has pledged $15 billion to begin to eradicate all lead service lines in this country. Um, we're also focused on some regulations that would bring that lead exposure down. It's important because certain populations in this country are disproportionately exposed to lead. And the president has pledged that in all of his pursuits, no communities would be left behind. Uh, this is something that we can and must do something about. And I just think that most people don't understand or think that members of their communities are drinking poison in their water. Yeah. And that's exactly what has been going on. And the president has, president has pledged to, to do away with that. And, and how does that effort to get rid of these lead pipes sort of fitted to the broader environmental justice uh, campaign that I know you guys are working on? You know, everything that we do at EPA is done through an environmental justice lens. Uh, the resources that we have, the regulations and policies that we design are designed to help those who are exposed the most first. And so when we think about less service lines, uh, obviously the criteria for giving this money to the states um, really is prioritized for those communities who are disproportionately exposed, which typically are black and brown or low income communities. Um, but, you know, with the Justice 40 initiative, 40 percent of all of the investments that we're making through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Inflation Reduction Act, 40 percent of those investments must go into and stay in frontline communities. Um, again, I think the president believes that solutions should come from the bottom up. Uh, and for those who have been at the back of the line, uh, they should get a fair shot 
in society just like everyone else. Um, I was reading a bit about you and I saw that you sort of got into this field because you grew up hunting and fishing. Um, what was uh, what kind of fish are we talking about here? Freshwater, saltwater, fly? Freshwater, largemouth bass. Largemouth bass. Yeah. A thing. good brim is fun to catch as well. No? Yeah. And I saw you were up in Alaska recently. Yes. Uh, dealing with the pebble mine issue. I actually worked on that back in the day, full disclosure, oh. trying to prevent the pebble mine, this horrible open pit mining operation from going into Bristol Bay, Alaska. Yeah. One of the most precious resources the country has. Um, did you get to fish up there? I did. You spent some time? I spent a little bit of time. You catch anything? Uh, yes. I think there's a picture that proves I caught at least one rainbow trout. How big? You know, <laughs> I didn't really come on this show to be embarrassed. <laughs> you didn't go over the big ass salmon that are supposed to you be know, everywhere? I did, but uh, apparently we went to a different fishing spot than they normally take the administrator, you know, and there wasn't that cage where they let the fish out so I could catch them. <laughs> so they had this little puny thing that I caught that maybe was about 14 to 16 inches. I just hand it to you. Like, yeah, hey, hold this up. <laughs> Wait, so, I mean, I, I asked this because it's interesting. I like to fish a lot too. I grew up fishing with my dad. But also, it feels like this is one of those areas where the uh, environmental movement crosses party lines. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a lot of Republicans who want to preserve lands and wateries for fishing, for hunting, because it's culture, it's part of a tradition. And I'm just wondering how you think about building the biggest possible coalition for your work and making sure that it feels as inclusive as possible. You know, that's just it. I think I, I grew up hunting and fishing, and I also grew up with respiratory challenges that were similar to asthma. So when you're out there and, and you have that asthma attack or that respiratory distress, that means you're not out there with dad or granddad. So you're missing out on the fun. Right. I think most people who understand and like sports can understand that if you have a bunch of pollution and you can't participate in sport, then you're missing out. Uh, I grew up in eastern North Carolina. And so um, in these rural communities, obviously, um, you have a lot of both red and blue homes that, quite frankly, all conversations aren't political. Right. They're more so focused on culture and the things that you enjoy. Uh, so when I talk about the environmental movement, I try to think about it through that lens, um, protecting natural resources for those who like to hunt and fish, thinking about economic development opportunities for those who think about the financial side. Uh, but, but listen, this is a long way from 1960 and tree hugging. When you think about today's environmentalist, you really are thinking about the latest and greatest technologies that you can apply to solving these problems. You know, um, growing up in eastern North Carolina, most of us like cars. Uh, I think it's really fun to drive an old car, an antique car. But if you like speed and if you've driven a 1967 Chevy with a 454 engine and then you jump into a Tesla, you know, the torque, uh, the technology, they're not even comparable. Right. So. There are ways that we can bridge all of these gaps. If you like speed, if you like technology, if you like making money, if you like hunting, if you like fishing, these are not blue and red issues. These are just American issues. And I try to talk about it in that way and try to visit communities that represent all of the things that you and I are discussing today. Yeah. Um, this is a part of the show I like to call dumb questions for smart people. Yeah. So I hope you'll indulge me. So <laughs> you're from North Carolina. Uh, why are Duke players and fans so insufferable? <laughs> I hope you're not a Duke fan. I should have <sighs> researched that first. I, I think that um, I have to go home and a lot of friends are there. So I would say that Duke fans aren't that bad. Come on. Come <laughs> on. Coach K like scolds the other teams, yells at the fans, berates his players when he loses. He's retired now. but Yeah, but see, you asked me a question about the players and now you're talking about the behavior of the coach. True, so, true, true. You know, I think I can agree with you on that. Who do you root for? It. I graduated from A&T State University, so I am a proud Aggie. Okay. And as you know, being and spending some time in North Carolina, getting into the ACC politics is a dangerous thing. <sighs> I know, I know. Yeah, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta steer clear of those, of those folks. Um, any relation to Ronald Reagan? You know, this is painful for me to say, but growing up in middle school, 
uh, I was really teased about being the illegitimate child around Reagan. <laughs> Come on, man. So, you know, you're bringing back a little bit of PTSD. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm really not appreciative of this right now. <laughs> uh, there goes my Nepo baby question. Uh, do you know where Kate Middleton is? Can the EPA help with that? Oh, wow. Wow. You know, I was just talking to my wife about that the other night. I, I came home and was really frustrated about working through, um, you know, a, a very technical rule. Uh -huh. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, right now I'm on a chain and we're trying to figure out where Kate Middleton is. I was, I was thinking we are living two different lives right about now. <laughs> Your marriage sounds a lot like my marriage. Um, which uh, invasive species do you hate the most? Ash borer, zebra mussel, Eric Trump. What are we <laughs> What are we looking at? What do we have our eye on these days? C. C. <laughs> uh, Invasive, do you guys handle invasive species or is that somebody else? Uh, we, we dibble and dabble a little bit, okay. but we share that with the Department of Interior. Gotcha. Okay. Rahm Emanuel used to get very mad about the Asian carp. That was ah. sort of my experience with this. They apparently <laughs> they jump out of the water, they hit people in boats and shit. It's a I've, problem. I've seen those videos. Uh, last question. And uh, if this is in your bag, tell me. Recycling. Yes. We all do it. It's important. Also, we judge others who don't do it. I don't know what really gets recycled, though. If I'm getting a bunch of takeout and I'm putting the little plastic containers in the special bin, is that like Penang stained plastic getting reused? Or is this like for show? How does this all work? Listen, first of all, let me say this. Um, I, I think I've traveled to about 38, 39 states and 13 countries. Um, when you talk about climate change, young people get excited. When you talk about plastics and recycling, it seems like the intensity of the excitement is about the same. So recycling, all jokes aside, has become a really big focus for EPA. My son is 10. And, you know, when it comes to recycling materials, he is all on it. So I have been looking into this question you okay. posed, which is, what are we really recycling? And right. Is it going to the right places? And I would say that the answer is it is increasingly getting better because uh, this country is starting to really understand how to monetize it. Huh, and okay. I think that once you introduce the ability to monetize, and we now have a market of young people and others who are demanding tighter standards, we're starting to see more interest in that area. But so glass is good, right? Like glass, put it in the recycling bin, it's going somewhere, it'll get used. I just worry about the plastic because it feels like it's all just winding up in like literally the middle of the Pacific Ocean, like going in circles and just not, not getting necessarily reused. But there's this industry that's telling us that these things are getting recycled. I feel like they're not sometimes. Well, th they haven't been traditionally. I think we're starting to see markets emerge where companies want the recycle products. Um, we, I was just in Ghana uh, recently and just looking at a bunch of entrepreneurs there that are really uh, into electronic recycling. Mm -hmm. And the things that they are refurbishing and the way they're reusing uh, older technology is just amazing. And so, you know, I was a little bit skeptical like you are, um, but my eyes have been open as I've been traveling the world and seeing not only how big of a problem it is, problem it is but how interested so many people are in it. And young people definitely are interested in recycling. Last question. When you meet with uh, skeptical Republicans, maybe they question... Uh, whether the government regulates too much, maybe they question, you know, whether climate change is man-made uh, in the role of the EPA. Do you ever just tell them, I work at an agency that uh, Nixon created? Does that, <laughs> does that like impact people? Do they realize that this was actually a creation of a Republican president? Yeah, I think most of them have forgotten that. Um, and most have forgotten that when you look at the Clean Air Act, um, and the revisions to the act uh, that was done during Republican administrations as well. Uh, I don't know where we got off track. Um, I don't either. Clean air and clean water should not be a partisan thing. And I, I think that as we move forward and as I move forward, I try to meet people where they are. I'll be honest with you. Most Republicans behind closed doors don't challenge me on climate science. Hmm. Um, the performative aspects when the lights and cameras are on, it's much different than yeah. the serious discussions that we're having behind closed doors. Then it's Larry Kudlow drinking meat beer. Uh, <laughs> Who's listening to that stuff, I, man? I don't know. All right, for God's sake, God help that man. Uh, Administrator Regan, thank you so much for, for coming and doing the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Appreciate it.
Thanks to Michael Regan for joining us today. Uh, everyone have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye, everyone.